about a liquidity crisis in Europe. Look at that. Wait for it, beer all over Angela Merkel. Now, is all that cheap liquidity generated by the ECP, ECB for Eurozone banks going right back to Germany as the weaker ones like Italy need to keep going back to the bar just to keep their glasses from draining? So will German banks be the prime candidates to engage in the ECB's upcoming LTRO carry trade? We'll break down carry trade in the back by popular demand word of the day. And what can we learn from Wiley Coyote here? Well, in economic terms, he just had a Minsky moment, and today we'll have a few more moments talking Minsky and what he can teach us about this new upside-down world that we are living in with our favorite economist from Down Under, Steve Keen. Let's get to today's Capital Account. So now Dublin will reportedly hold a referendum on the Eurozone Fiscal Compact. So now, according to the Financial Times, this is plunging Europe into months of uncertainty and potentially placing a question mark over Ireland's membership of the Euro. Now, the former Prime Minister of Ireland is out saying this is a bad idea. A no vote could have too big a consequence, could mean Ireland's out of the Euro. We can't be rattling those markets, got to worry about the markets, can't shake the bond markets. We know how powerful they are. And let's remember the last time we saw this in the Eurozone crisis in Greece when Athens called for a referendum. It was pretty much the last time we heard from the country's democratically elected Prime Minister Papandreou as he was quickly replaced with an appointed technocrat, not to mention former central banker, Lucas Papademos, to administer the market's tough medicine. So is this another example where democracy is just, uh, you know, a little too inconvenient for European politicians and policymakers? And as Eurocrats keep trying to prop up zombie banks, is what we're really seeing just the spread of this zombie mentality from free market capitalism to democratic governance? That's the big question we want to ask. And to answer it, Steve Keen, associate professor at the University of Western Sydney and author of this book, Debunking Economics, the Naked Emperor Dethroned. And as always, it is just such a pleasure to talk to you and to see you, Dr. Keen. Thank you, Lauren. Yes. So, you know, this is actually very fortuitous. A little bit of trivia. The last time we had you on, Steve, was the day before the first LTRO operation by the ECB in Europe. And now, fast forward, and again, it is the day before the next LTRO operation of the ECB in Europe. So you're actually the perfect person to talk about these kind of liquidity transfusions. And to answer this question, Dr. Keen, is this just another way to prop up zombie banks and allow them to roll over their debt? Absolutely, because the whole solution is saying, here we have a problem where a country can't pay enough money, uh, can't pay the debts it's currently got, let's lend it more money. <laughs> and uh, well, so long as it's money which the government, it's, the country itself can't generate through its central bank, which of course no European country has, then it's just perpetuating the problem. And is this an inevitable outgrowth of the banking system? Because as you point out, Ponzi financiers always have debt servicing costs that are higher than their cash flows because the assets they purchased with borrowed money. So they have to expand their debts or sell off assets. And in Europe, we've seen banks do anything to avoid selling off assets. Yeah, well, the, the Europeans have got their own peculiar problem and paste it on top of what America is going through and will continue going through for some years, if not decades. And that's the, of course, you said Ponzi lending, where you had banks lending money to finance people gambling and rising asset prices. And whereas lending that finances investment, innovation, technology, and expansion of markets can actually generate income that services the debt at a later stage, borrowing to gamble on rising asset prices doesn't generate the capacity to pay that debt. So you simply have to take out more debt to continue servicing it. And you ultimately hit the brick wall as we did back in 2007. Now the Europeans added to that by A, believing that process was impossible. Mm -hmm. B, by then erecting a set of uh, limitations mm -hmm. of what the government could do and the belief that only government could cause the problems. Mm -hmm. C, setting up a system which meant that the European periphery countries couldn't possibly compete with Germany and then be ready, ready to penalise them when they, when they failed to be able to do what was impossible anyway. Mm -hmm. And then 
the, 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 the financial crisis from the land, the land speculation, the, the same bubble behaviour in, in many of the peripheral countries in particular, but also these days, I'm told, France as well, uh, speculation on rising, uh, rising land house prices, it all comes a cropper. And what's their solution? To throw yet more debt at the problem without changing the system that doesn't allow the countries to generate their own currency. Yeah. It's a catastrophe. Yeah. A catastrophe, and I want to talk a little bit later about what you're talking about and you've been writing about, about some of the solutions to this speculation that's so problematic no matter where you are. But let's stick to Europe, because uh, when we look at something like the LTRO and some of these, you know, quote unquote solutions that their leaders are coming up with in Europe, what about the imbalances? Because if all of this money, for example, just ends up in Germany and flees from the periphery where people are more worried about weakened banks, don't we then get imbalances perpetuated and have a situation where the core has a lot of money and can just go, you know, buying up all of the uh, assets of Greece and essentially turning it into something like a colony? Well, this is what's happening because, of course, they're talking about giving the money to Greece. What they're saying is, say, give the money to Greece so Greece can pay their pay the banks they owe money to. So it's a transfer from German, the German central bank, down to the Greek government, back to German and French banks, mm -hmm. and it's really maintaining liquidity of the banking sectors in Northern Europe that financed this bubble in the first place. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than financing the Greeks themselves. And of course, the reaction, anybody with money in Greece wants to get it out of Greece now. Mm -hmm. So what you, as, as well as in, indebting them and giving them, I'm, I'm told by one correspondent on Twitter recently, an interest bill of $330 per month per, per, per Greek person to those banks. Uh, it, they're being drained by the interest payments. They're also going to be drained by a capital flight. And this money is not going Mm -hmm. not going and not staying in Greece when it goes down there. So it's, it's, it's almost like putting leeches on the patient. We're going to have 19th century medicine becomes 21st century economics. Yeah, and yet you have definitely very much 21st century speculation uh, that's creating these problems too. Sticking on Europe, though, we have a little theory on this show because one of the things we've seen is that as central banks' balance sheets have expanded and we've seen governments uh, put into place some very severe reforms in order to prop up zombie banks, democracy hasn't been the most convenient thing to pass some of these reforms. And we've seen technocrats put in place. We've seen the democratic process in some of these countries suspended. So we're wondering if we're seeing zombie banks and as it's kind of that mentality go into zombie governments and is this something that we're going to see a continuing trend of? We're getting a zombie democracy. It's, that's a good expression. Uh, this really is just a continuation of conventional neoclassical thinking. But now it's neoclassical thinking in a position of economic failure rather than economic strength. Mm -hmm. Because neoclassical theory always argued that democracy was an impediment to doing good economics. So that's mm -hmm. the reason you had things like central banks getting independence from the governments to set interest rates, because they didn't trust the politicians to get it right. Yeah. So that the bankers yeah. do it instead, and the banks take over that responsibility. Then, of course, the Maastricht Treaty was there pretty much asking European governments to sign a straitjacket saying you won't do anything to try to change the economy, will you? you know, right. Uh, again, right. drafted by the, uh, the zombie controllers in the, in the European Commission who believe in neoclassical economics. So they said you can't, uh, we're not going to let you have exchange rate policy because you've all got one currency. We're not going to let you have monetary policy because the European Central Bank now controls the setting of interest rates. And we're not going to let you have fiscal policy either because we won't, won't, won't let you run a deficit of more than 3% of GDP, nor will we let you have more than 60% accumulated government debt to GDP. Now, all those basically saying we are putting democracy in a straitjacket. You guys can go and talk about Eurovision Song Contests and, and uh, international diplomacy and stuff like that, but you can't touch the economy. That was all supposed to mean the economy would work better. Right. Okay? It right. wasn't supposed to lead to this catastrophe. But now that it's led to the catastrophe, they're thinking, oh, hell, how do we balance all this stuff and make it hold together? Well, we've got to, we can't let democracy get in the way. Yeah. Let's do things like appoint an ex European uh, economic bureaucrat to run Greece and run Italy so we make sure the austerity programs are imposed. And let's not let democracy get in the way of a referendum with the, uh, with the Irish, which is saying right now. So it's a classic case. Economic theory said democracy was the failure. Mm -hmm. Let's let economics take over and get away from it. Now, the economic theory itself is being a complete failure. They're saying, let's not let democracy get in the way because we're trying to keep all the stuff in the air without admitting we failed. 
I love it, Dr. Keene. You can always bring it back to the problem with economics. That's so perfectly fitting. Uh, sticking to this, though, riddle me this. Are we going to see a Minsky moment then with technocracy where zombie governments become so over leveraged that they crumble? The pyramid scheme just crumbles under the weight of popular uprisings like we've begun to see in Greece? This is this is exactly what I'm expecting. I've, I mean, my gamble has been that at some stage we're likely to see the the, the military junta back in control in Greece because Greece has a history of having military governments. Yeah. Uh, we're likely yeah. to see popular uprisings in parts of Spain, which has had a history of popular up revolt, revolt as well. The Portuguese have had a left wing coup against their Salazar uh, uh, leadership decades ago that gave us the. Uh, ending the East Timor occupation, for example. Mm -hmm. So we have all these potential political shifts from the outside because if you imagine the military in Greece, sitting back, watching what's happening on the streets of Greece, watching what's being done to national pride, mm -hmm. and one thing about leading military officials, they tend to have a fair degree of national pride. At some point, they're going to say, let's... If, if we can't get rid of the... If, if, the, if the, the politicians are going to be beholden to the foreign banks, we're not. Mm -hmm. So at some stage, I do expect to see huge political shifts in Europe. And then you might see something sensible coming out of the remaining European democratic governments. Mm, OK, so that might be the tipping point that wakes up zombie democracy and brings it back to life. Let's broaden this, though, because you, you spoke about the problem with speculation. This is a problem very much that we have dealt with in the United States, problem in Europe, problem for the global economy. So how do we unwind this very dangerous, vicious cycle of the banks taking all of this risk and speculating and then governments propping them up? Because after all, banks love speculation, Dr. Keene. This is how they make money. That's right. They make money by gambling on rising asset prices. And ironically, the fact that they're lending the money causes the asset prices to rise in the first place. Yeah. It's what engineers call yeah. a positive feedback loop. The trouble is positive feedback loops work like this. They go up and then they go down because you get to a point where uh, it rising in levels of asset prices generate accelerating levels of debt. Then you get to the point where people get so much debt that they simply slow down slightly and that then means the asset prices start to fall and exactly the same process works in reverse. Falling asset prices mean rapidly decelerating debt which causes asset prices to fall further. So we go through this sawtooth process in capitalism over a period of decades. If the banks are allowed to fund gambling on asset prices and that includes lending money to gamble on rising house prices, margin loans for buying shares, etc., etc. All that sort of behaviour ultimately ends in a catastrophe. So we have to... We can't stop the banks wanting to do that because banks have an inherent desire to create debt because the more debt they create, the more profits they can make. Right. And you said that's, that's right. the volume side of their price-time volume equation. We have to make debt less attractive to borrowers. And my argument is that we have to redefine shares so that it's no longer attractive to borrow money to buy shares off another speculator, which mm -hmm. is what gives us asset price bubbles in shares, mm -hmm. and to redefine housing so banks can't lend more than a fixed amount, a maximum amount of money to secure against property, no matter who the borrower is. Mm -hmm. So, so quality, make it quality. less. Oh, sorry. So make it less attractive to borrow. But, but real quickly before we go, an article that I saw you tweeted uh, showed another side of this, which is that. Even if you do that, uh, one in seven Americans are being stalked by a debt collector right now, showing just how much debt is still out there in this system. So without some kind of, I don't know, huge debt jubilee like you've called for, are we just going to see a perpetuated problem of people being debt slaves? Yeah, they are. We've got two issues. One is how we stop this happening again, and two, to how we get out of the catastrophe we're in right now. And we have to do it in such a way that we drastically reduce the power and the income levels of the financial sector. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm calling what I call a modern debt jubilee, mm -hmm. where we have quantitative easing for the public rather than for the banks. And then that money is then used to reduce debt levels, but also give cash to those people who bought the... the, the, the um, toxic assets off the banks, believing they were a decent source of income over time, mm -hmm. give them a cash bundle to spend out of instead, reduce the debt level and squeeze the profit and the income levels of the financial sector, and then finally break the politicians from being beholden to the financial sector, because this is the classic case where the zombies own the blood bank. Yeah, We've got to, there we've got you to go. End that. The zombies in the blood bank. And until we do something about those blood transfusions, this is going to continue. Dr. Keene, it's always a pleasure to see you. I appreciate your insight so much. That was Steve Keene, economist and author.